Hi. Right behind me is a pretty unassuming forest. That forest is in France. But I'm in Switzerland. Yep, that's right. I'm standing right on the border between Switzerland and France at a place called Marianne. That's not why I'm actually standing on this particular spot. More importantly, I'm standing on the world's largest physics experiment. Yep, that's right. I'm actually standing at the site of CERN. And on this spot, right below me, 100 meters underground, are the pipes of the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. Pipes that fire protons in that direction and protons in that direction at extremely fast speeds, in fact, close to the speed of light. And that are places at detectors such as Atlas, which is just over there, and also CMS, which is a number of kilometers in that direction over there, those particles are made to collide. So in this video, I'm going to be discussing the physics behind the LHC, so stay tuned. Now before I continue, although the specifics of the LHC may not necessarily be part of your high school curriculum, I plan to incorporate physics content that most high school students should be familiar with. Now, a synchrotron is simply a circular path accelerator designed to speed up charged particles. And generally, the larger they are, the faster that they can speed up the particles. So here I have a circular path and I have a particle that goes around a circle. Obviously, it'll move at a particular velocity, but I need something also to accelerate it. So I have this little section here where after the particle has gone through the section, it actually goes faster and then continues to speed up and around and around and around. So in essence, there are two basic needs that a synchrotron needs. The first thing it needs is a force to continue to keep it in a circle. Now that is the Lorentz force. And the Lorentz force becomes also your centripetal force. So if I have my Lorentz force, which is QVB, that becomes our mv squared over R. And a little rearranging will show that R ends up being equal to mv squared over QVB, which then becomes, of course, mv over QB. Now mv is its momentum, so you might as well just simplify it as P over QB. The second thing it needs is a force to accelerate it, and that is due to an electric field that is being applied to our charge. And that means our electric field can be determined by a voltage difference over a certain distance. And in essence, these two concepts, the Lorentz force and the force due to an electric field are the two key concepts involving a synchrotron. Now the first synchrotron was, came onto line in 1949 and was relatively small. Now some synchrotrons actually speed up electrons, which can be used for collisions, but also electrons moving around a synchrotron release a, a radiation called synchrotron radiation. And so that can be used for other experiments. So a good example for that is the ANSTO synchrotron based in Melbourne in Australia, where it uses the synchrotron radiation that comes off these particles in a whole range of applications, such as agriculture, biomedicine, environmental sustainability, food and food technology, just to name a few. Now, I plan to produce a video which will examine the Australian synchrotron more closely, so stay tuned. Now, there are also synchrotrons that actually speed up large ions, such as the LEIR, or the Low Energy Iron Ring, which is also based in CERN. Now, the LHC accelerates protons, and it is one of a series of synchrotrons at CERN. It just happens to be that the LHC is the world's largest synchrotron, and is designed to speed up protons, moving in opposing directions so that they can be made to collide. And here you can see a schematic of the Large Hadron Collider. We have the large 27 kilometer ring. We have also shown here the super proton synchrotron, which is a smaller synchrotron. And we have, of course, the four main detectors that sit on the ring, Atlas, LHCB, CMS, and Alice. And all of this is 100 meters underneath the border of Switzerland and France. Now, you can see here, just like the LAIR, that it's not truly circular. There are curved components that are circular in the geometry, but there are also straight sections. So although I'm going to be using the LHC as our example of uh, the workings of a synchrotron, the basic workings that I'll discuss 
are pretty much the same in most synchrotrons that will that you can be studying. So we're going to concern ourselves to really four main aspects of the synchrotron. Number one, how do they speed up those particles? Number two, how can we make them turn? We're going to briefly also discuss how we keep the particle beams together or focus them. And finally, I will also explain why we call it a synchrotron. And I will put the times in the description below if you want to jump straight to the appropriate section. Now at CERN, the aim is to get the protons to 99.9999991% of the speed of light. That's only 3 meters per second under the speed of light. Now these protons don't travel actually alone. They actually travel in bunches and there are about 100 billion protons per bunch. So when the LHC is actually running, there are 2,808 of these bunches traveling at that speed, around 11,245 times a second around the 27 kilometer loop, with about seven and a half meters between each bunch. Now the speed determines the energy of the proton and accounting for relativity, it's often quoted in terms of energy terms or in electron volts. So you can see in this animation that the speed is attained gradually through a series of synchrotrons of increasing sizes so that eventually it reaches a total of 7,000 billion electron volts or seven tera electron volts. Now that's like having about the equivalent of 170 Big Macs. So how does the synchrotron do that? Now the source of the protons is simply a bottle of hydrogen. They are basically fired through a cavity that rips the electrons off and now you have protons. Then they pass through a series of radio frequency cavities that speed them up as well as force them into bunches. But how does that work? So here's my charged particle and I want to speed it up and I'm going to speed it up through a series of terminals. Now of course it becomes an anode if it's positively charged and a cathode if it's negatively charged, but it doesn't have to remain positive or negatively charged. So here is a cross section. Here's my proton, red being positive, and it's accelerating towards a cathode. Now I've got it, I've got it here labeled blue. But as it passes through the cathode, what's going to happen is that another particular cathode will come into play. Now it's already there. I'm just doing this to show you how it works. And of course it's attracted towards this particular cathode. And now because the previous terminal has now become an anode, positively charged, it's going to repel away from that. So what you end up getting is an electric field going in that direction in this particular moment in time. Now as my particle travels through that, then it's going to experience a third terminal. In this case, the previous terminals become an anode and the next terminals become a cathode. So again, at that time, it's producing an electric field in that direction as it passes through. And then again, as the particle goes through, it repeats the process. And every time my positively charged particle is experiencing an electric field that pushes it on further. So it's going to continue to accelerate bit by bit. So as you can see though, that this would become really inefficient. And since the rate at which the voltage changes has to be kept in sync with the speed of the charges every time it goes around, the frequencies will start to get higher and higher and higher. And eventually the frequency are going into the microwave range. And that becomes an important point. So really, instead of using cathodes and anodes switching, the acceleration is actually done by a resonant frequency chamber or RF chamber. Now in the LHC, there are a modules containing four of four resonating chambers such as the one here. So considering the LHC has a circumference of 27 kilometers, only about 16 meters or so are actually devoted to the accelerating the proton. So as the particle passes through these chambers, they rapidly experience changing electric fields at microwave frequencies. And this causes the proton bunches to get sped up. In other words, they get a speed boost. So in essence, the charges are riding an electromagnetic wave in the RF chamber, a bit like a surfer in the sea who's sitting in front of the wave to increase their speed. So now let's examine how the charges are made to turn using the Lorentz force. Now, although there is only one small section of the LHC devoted to speeding up the charges, the vast majority is made up of magnets designed to bend and focus the beam. The main unit for the bending magnet is often referred to as the dipole 
and it is a 15 meter long pipe that basically contains the two pipes that carry the proton beams. Over the 9,500 magnets in the LHC ring, 1,232 of these are the dipole magnets, and therefore there are 308 at every turn. So here you can see a 15 meter section of pipe being lowered on a truck. In fact, the limit of the pipe is actually due to the road limits that these trucks can actually carry. You can see over here on the right hand side, the pipe being lowered down a tunnel, which is the service tunnel for, for the LHC, because it's 100 meters underground. So you get a sense of how big that tunnel is. And me hugging this tube shows you approximately its diameter. So here's a cross section of the dipole tube. You can see that our actual pipes that carry the beam, which is in these spaces right here, that most of it is actually support structures for the beam itself. We have um, we, these yokes, which are going to provide both the strength that this, these pipes need, and I'll explain why that is the case in a moment. It'll provide also the magnetic fields that would be needed to deflect the beam. And of course, we also have lots of space to allow the flow of liquid helium, which is going to cool this down to under two Kelvin. And again, I'll explain that in a second. Moving that away, you can see here a cross section of my pipe. We have here the yokes that hold this all together. These straps here are going to be our electromagnets that provide the magnetic field. And then inside this tube, you'll also have this tube right here. You'll see that the inner pipe has holes in it. So let's check in from CERN as to why this is the case. Why is it perforated? You notice that. Very yes. good. So you're talking about this? Yes. This film from top. Uh, because it has as well, uh, it has a certain perforation on the side. You can, oh. you can touch it with a finger. Oh, it does. Oh, it does. Yeah, yeah. So it's all uh, not, uh, not by coincidence. Everything okay. has its purpose. So the top ones uh -huh. are for so-called dark currents. So as I just mentioned, every moving charged particle generates current all around oh. you. So if you don't have these, the charged currents can induce and they yeah, can interfere okay. with the magnetic field. Okay. Like eddy currents? Sorry? Like eddy currents. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly yeah. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we have this performance uh, here. They are extremely non-repetitable. Uh, so they, there's like a random pattern applied. So now let's have a closer look of our Lorentz force. So here we have our pipes and our pipes will carry protons. They are going to be represented by these red arrows. You'll see that they're in opposite directions because at certain points in the LHC, those two beams are made to collide. We want a force that ensures that the force is going to be in the same direction. And we're going to want a force that is in that the direction. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to do that by applying an electromagnetic effect. And here is our coils. You can see we're going to get currents that are flowing in one direction clockwise up here and anti-clockwise here. These two coils will therefore produce magnetic fields in opposing directions. And when combined, the magnetic field is going to look something like this. Now you can see that my magnetic field will be such that it's going downward in this direction and upward in this direction. And that means using your appropriate hand rule that the force, the Lorentz force, will be in the same direction. Now, the force that's required is actually quite large. And in order to produce the force to make this turn, because remember, the Lorentz force is ultimately equal to QVB, and we know that V is a very large, then the magnetic field we need to cause this to turn is approximately 8 Tesla. Now that's so large that conventional wires are unable to produce magnetic fields that allow us to have a Tesla. In fact, the maximum uh, magnetic field for conventional electromagnets with conventional wires, even the best materials that you can have, is approximately only one Tesla. So the only way we can achieve these um, 
magnetic fields is by the use of superconductors. And with superconductors, we're able to achieve a current of in the range of 11,500 amps. And that will allow us to get the magnetic fields we need of about eight Tesla. To get the superconductors working, you need to lower their temperatures. This particular material is a material that is nobilium uh, 3SN. It's a, a particular material designed at CERN. Now it's critical temperature is in the range of about two Kelvin or minus 271 degrees below zero. That's colder than space folks. And so in order to do that, they bathe this in liquid helium and liquid helium is at the same temperature at this particular temperature. So that's why this is kept particular cool. So CERN is not just interested in magnets and electromagnets and charged particles, but also in cryogenics in order to cool these tubes to the particular temperature in order to get the magnetic field required to actually cause the Lorentz force to work. But we have one other little problem. And if you notice here, we have two sections of wires that are close together that are carrying currents in the same direction. And because they're in the same direction, you know that in terms of Ampere's law, that the force per unit length is going to be proportional to the individual currents divided by the distance separated by them. And so therefore you're going to get in this case a very strong attractive force between the two, which you have to certainly try to stop from occurring. So going back to our diagram, you can see these yokes here. We've got our electromagnets here, which provide us the magnetic fields, but we have these huge stainless steel yokes that are designed to stop these two pipes from approaching each other. And of course, we've got also these pipes here because those pipes are needed to increase the magnetic flux passing through my coils or what we refer to as flux linkage. So that's a brief overview of the forces at work in order to turn our proton beam. So apart from the dipoles, there are also a series of magnets called quadrupoles and there are 392 of them in this in the LHC whose job is to focus the beam. Now protons are positively charged so they would normally repel away from each other as they move around and you don't want that to occur. So you have quadrupoles will we'll squeeze them. So a series of four electromagnets, hence quadrupoles, are applied to squeeze the beams together both in terms of the x direction and the y direction. Finally, why do we call it the synchrotron? Well, our force, our Lorentz force, is equal to QVB. And therefore, because this is going to be our centripetal force, you're going to get a value for the radius equaling to MV over QB. Now that means that if my velocity is increasing, my momentum is increasing. But we want to keep the radius constant. So the magnetic field has to increase as well at the same rate at which the momentum is going to increase. And therefore, it has to be kept in sync with the momentum to keep that radius constant. And that's what synchrotron means. It literally means keeping in time. And of course, as well as our resonant chambers also have need to alternate at a rate that is consistent with the speed of our proton bunches. So that's why it's called a synchrotron. So I hope that's helped you understand the basics of the physics behind the LHC. And clearly it's only the basics, there's a lot more physics there. But at least you'll have an introduction to the LHC and also how the physics concepts you learn in high school and a little bit beyond apply to the workings of the LHC. In future videos, I'm going to be discussing the workings of the particle detectors, other aspects that occur at CERN, and hopefully You'll like, share and subscribe to my channel so that you can keep up to date with my videos. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.